Hey, everybody, welcome to a special edition of the Sick Podcast with Adam Rank. Now, every Tuesday night, we are still going to continue to do Take It to the Rank. We are talking about the latest news and notes with the Chicago Bears. But since the Chicago Bears are, I guess, a better way to put it, uh, the bell of the ball, in some respects, the number one overall pick, a, the first time this has happened in the modern era of the NFL, the Super Bowl era for sure. So we're, we're trying to feel this out. And so obviously you see a lot of people going out there, putting out mock drafts, a lot of rumors going on. We're going to be discussing a lot of that today. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Adam Ray. Trying to cut it back. Justin Fields making magic happen. There goes Fields. Touchdown. The Sickest Chicago Bears and Fantasy Football Podcast. Brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Sports entertainment like no other. It's going to be sick. Very excited to uh, to be bringing on Jason Lock and Fora later on in the show. I know for a lot of you, uh, you don't like Jason, and uh, it, it always hurts me as a as a as a, a friend of Jason's who always enjoyed working with him at the NFL Network. Uh, but hopefully, maybe I listen. He probably doesn't care if he wins you over or not. But we're going to be talking about some of the rumors coming around with the number one overall pick. But I do want to talk uh, mock drafts. And right now, we're going to be joined by one of the best in the business. He is a friend of mine. He is one of my colleagues at the NFL Network. And you know a lot of people go out there and they put out a one-round mock draft. At some point this spring, I will be putting out my mock draft with a twist, things that teams should do. But this man has gone out there already and done a three-round mock draft. And if you were a fan, of the Chicago Bears, and I know there's some of you who who listen to us who aren't, and I appreciate that. But we're going to dive into that, and please welcome to the show right now one of the most esteemed, esteemed draft analysts out there, Chad Reuter, joining us all the way from one of the suburbs of Chicago, Madison, Wisconsin. How are you, Chad? Uh, I guess I'll take that. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, for having me on today. Appreciate it, despite that intro. Despite that was, glo- I love you. It was glowing until the Chicago suburb part. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. I, I can't resist myself sometimes. You I, know me. Like I just, I just, I want to be super pleasant, and then I, I just can't. I can't stop being a jerk, and uh, that's what happens. What is your, uh, what is your life like though? I, I was thinking about this this morning. You know, for somebody like me, who a lot of the work that I do for the NFL Network, fantasy football, June through the end of December, that is really my peak. For you, it doesn't feel like you ever get a break because you have to be going nonstop because, you know, while a lot of things are going on, you have to watch all the college tape and you got everything going on. What is your year like? Because this seems insane to me. So, um, you know, the draft happens late April, early May. I start in on the next class. So all summer I'm watching players, researching players. Um, Adam, as you know, I provide a lot of the research that people get that are on set things like that, um, you know, for, about all the players that are out there. So that during the summer, I'm doing that, trying to get rid of that, because if I waited to do that until now, it would be impossible. So it's a 12 month a year job. And, um, um, and I love it. So I, I I'm, this is, uh, you know, I, this is what I've, I've always wanted to do, and I'm doing it. So I love it. So yeah, it's college, you know, all fall uh, during on NFL.com. You may people may have seen my Senior Bowl watch list updates every couple of weeks to see who the top seniors are that were on that list. And so, you know, it's a uh, you know doing that. And then obviously this is this is my time of the year where the mocks come out and I do other writing. And so it's a uh, you know it's really my uh, my focus is now. And it's really one of those things that for somebody like myself who doesn't get a a, a huge opportunity, especially now I have two young kids. I don't watch as much college football as I used to. And I know that obviously, as you said, a lot of the research that you provide is stuff that we use on the shows. And I remember sp- specifically last year, uh, I had uh, found, fa- I, I discovered, no, I had heard about Brees Hall. I did not get an opportunity to see him play. I went out, watched some of the YouTube highlights. I didn't, and I watched, I watched one of his games. I actually went to your, to your analysis, looked it up, checked out Brees Hall, Last year, and so I, maybe I'm exposing myself as a big fraud, but I used a lot of Chad's analysis. Was one of the reasons why I was so hyper on Brees Hall, and it paid off. I mean, he was good. I mean, he got injured, but I mean, he was a great player. So even if you're not a Bears fan and you're listening yeah. in, 
a lot of this stuff, a lot of what Chad does is going to pay off for you, especially if you love fantasy. But if you, even if you just love the NFL, make sure you're doing it. And you're doing a three-round mock draft. How difficult is it to do a three-round? One round seems fun. Yeah. Uh, I burn out after 15 picks. This year, with the Bears being number one, I'll probably burn out after the first first four, maybe. But uh, how, how difficult is it to put all, all that together? Uh, it takes a while. It takes a while. Um, dozens of hours. But look, it's a labor of love. And it's really just a puzzle. That's really all it is. And you've got different team needs, free agency, obviously the player evaluations and all that. And you're just trying to make, you know, a mock draft soup out of it. And uh, you try to do things a little differently than other people. You know, if I'm putting out the same thing that Daniel Jeremiah is doing or Bucky Brooks is doing, that's that's not really good value for the reader. So I try to do things a little differently. Um, again, I'm a math guy, so I love de- getting into the trades and what would have to happen for different trades to happen and, and things like that. So, um, it's a lot of fun for me. And, um, so I do this three round mock, but then I have two, four round mocks coming up here in the next month or so. Woo. And then, um, and then the seven round is always the big one, you know, right before the draft. So, uh, they all have their different challenges, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun for me. Did you have Braxton Jones last year in your seven man? I I forgot to go back and check. Yeah, I don't remember where I would have had him, but I figured, you know, the day three, five to seven is about right for him. Um, um, You know, I liked a lot of things I saw from him coming out of college, but um, and and I'm glad to see him. You know, he had some issues this year, as any rookie would, but, uh, you know, I think he's going to have a long career. Yeah, and it, one of the things that stood out about him was the athleticism, which is something, and I noticed a trend in a lot of the mock draft picks that you've done so far for the Chicago Bears. We'll get to that in just a moment. Yeah. Uh, a- athletic athletic offensive lineman, which is something that's going to be a hallmark of Ryan Poles moving forward as his uh, tenure with the, as GM of the Chicago Bears. So, of course, we have the Bears at the number one overall pick. Outside of some people who think, they're not that people think this, but you know there is some speculation that perhaps the Bears could take a quarterback there, move on from Justin Fields. You have the Bears trading. How did you come to the conclusion? Does it seem likely that the Bears are going to make a trade with that number one pick? It it seems likely to me. Uh, You know, if they move on from Justin Fields, that would be a surprise to me Mm -hmm. because you got a guy that a lot of teams probably wish they would have picked now. (laughs) Yeah, Um, Denver, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Patrick Sertan, nice corner, but I think Fields would have been pretty good there. You wouldn't have had to trade for Russell Wilson, so you would have yeah. had additional picks. So, I mean, I think I, I think Fields is a good quarterback, and I think they'll stick with him. And uh, you know, the funny thing is, Adam, that they're if they move the if they get these trades done, mm-hmm. they're going to have extra future picks. And let's just say Justin Fields doesn't turn out in the next year. You know, it doesn't. They can move on from him because they're getting these additional selections, um, and then continue to build around their next guy. So. You know, ever since the Cardinals picked quarterbacks in the top 10 two years in a row, teams know that, it. look, if it's clear it's not working, we can move on, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't think Justin Fields is at that point right now. Yeah. I think he played well enough where I think you, you can continue to build around him and, and see what you've got uh, before you before you would uh, move on. So, yeah, trade that pick for as much as you can possibly get and uh, see if you can build the team around him. The uh, the Caleb Williams insurance policy. I don't know if we can actually go out there and say his name. I know with the NFL, we're always kind of rest- restricted on how yeah. these younger guys that we can talk about. Well, so. look, Caleb Williams. It's no surprise to anybody out of USC. Yeah. He's going to be a top pick for somebody. This is not you know we're not doing anything out of school here uh, at, at this point. But yeah, there you know look, there's going to there's everybody you know will go into a well, many years they'll go into a draft saying oh next year's group is going to be better than this year's group <laughs> next year's group they always say that right and then right. it is or it isn't but you know there are some guys next year um Caleb being the number one guy I think that teams will be looking at no for sure and it's funny we, we we don't have to worry about the call from Jim Loftus being like you guys aren't supposed to talk about underclass yeah. but in any event um everybody knows who they are but here's uh yes. the dive into what the Bears did listen your mock I didn't bring you on because I specifically loved your mock draft, but it also did help. Um, And you know what? I like the thing that I like about this is like now everybody can go to like different sites and make their own mock drafts. And you're like, hey, I've got the Bears getting 212 Houston's next four number one pick. You're like, dude, that's that's not happening. Uh, You have a very realistic scenario with the Bears moving down with Houston for second overall. The Bears would get the Browns third round pick this season and the Browns first 
for 2024. Do I have that correct? Correct. Correct. Yep. How do you come up that? How do you come up with that formula? Well, I mean, I look at past trades that might be similar. Um, and then also there are many trade value charts out there that assign a, a number to each pick. And then you 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 take what each side is giving in the pick and make sure that the numbers sort of add up. Um, now, those numbers are not going to be the same, especially for a team that's trying to get up and there's competition for that pick. Um, so like the bears are in a good position where I'm sure Indianapolis, Houston, Carolina, they they have a few suitors. So the price that they can extract, um, is going to be a little higher. So they won't have to give up a, as much in, in the deal. So, you know, it's, it's, you look at those trade value charts and it's like, Oh, it's gotta be 2000 points on this side, 2000 points on this side. No, that's not how it works. It's sort of like baseball cards. When you look up how much your Mickey Mantle is worth, it says yeah. $15,000, but only if somebody pays you $15,000, right? So that's just a, a, a general idea. But I think the Bears are in a really good position to get more than that chart would say in value for their pick because there's the competition for that selection. I think a lot of people will look at this and be, why don't they get number 12? Or why don't they get Houston's second round pick? Why do you, how is that not feasible? I, I just, I explain. I mean, it's feasible. Like it. It's feasible. But I think if you're Chicago, you want that future first pick. Mm -hmm. That would be the number one priority is getting that future first pick. And if you get that, then it's much less likely that you're going to get 12 or, or the second round pick. That's, yeah. you know, I, the, the, they'll get more value than the chart says, but not that much more value. Right. I mean, unless, yeah. unless like somebody is offering a crazy amount, like the Colts are offering three number one picks or something, <laughs> or, you know what? I mean, if, if other teams are giving these, then maybe, you know, there's an RG three move where somebody wants to give up three number one picks for them possibly, but realistically speaking, if you get that number one pick, you're not going to get a first or second round pick in the current draft. Um, yeah. And that's it. So, and, and really in this particular time they're, they're trading with Houston. So it's only a one spot trade. Yeah. Now, if you're talking Indianapolis and that'll Which be a I, different thing, then, to, then you might get some of that more. So it's a little different because they're going up a few more spots. And so it, it, it's all dependent on who it is and what the competition is. And the Bears you have moving down with the Indianapolis Colts. They would go from two to four, getting the second round pick of the Colts and a second and third next year, if that's I have right. this correct. That's right. So, yeah, in the two trades. And that's why I wanted to lay it out this way, because I didn't – maybe somebody else has done it this way. I hadn't seen anybody I, this else. Is, honestly, this is the only one that I've seen like this, okay. and this one seems like the most realistic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one way to do it. Um, so, in the end, they end up with – you know, first, second, and third next year between the two deals, you end up first, second, and third next year, a second and third this year, and then moving down three spots. I mean, I don't know how much you can better you can do than that. Um, and, and if, and if it ends up that the Colts maybe end up being the, the only team that goes up and you don't do this other intermediate trade with the Texans and the Colts are going to have to give up something similar, not maybe quite that much, but something similar to that because they, the bears had say, Hey, look, I could trade with Houston and then I could trade with you guys. And, so, um, yeah, that's that's the way I wanted to put it out there as one potential thing. And the one um, possible issue is if they make that trade with Houston early, mm -hmm. then Indianapolis may be like, well, you know what? Since we're not getting our first pick, we're not as interested in moving into two as we would have been into number one. So there is some risk there for the Bears that maybe they wouldn't get as much as they could making the four to one trade. But you know, I, who knows? Who knows what will happen? Colts have already said, hey, we'll do whatever we take to get our guy. And to me, that means if the Bears have the two pick, then you trade in a number two pick instead of the number one pick. If you're doing everything that you can to get the quarterback you want. Well, yeah, because the Colts would also conceivably have competition with the Carolina Panthers moving That's up right. to number two. There's somebody who could move into number three if the Cardinals wanted to move down. Right. But it feels like, and what you're saying is, as long as the Bears get the first round pick next season, yeah. And I think for a lot of Bears fans, what they get lost in is they they keep thinking that we're going to get 30 picks for this thing. But remember, we were a a fourth and long away from just having the number two pick. Right. So the fact that if if nothing, if, if the only dr trade that we make gets us the Browns third round pick this season and a first rounder next season, that's still worth it. It is right. still a worthwhile trade. We're still yeah. coming out. Now, the player that you have us ending up with, Will Anderson Jr., 
Uh, obviously, we wouldn't have a choice because it's – well, number one, uh, a quarterback could go number three if somebody trades up with the Arizona Cardinals. Yep. If the Bears had a choice between the two top defenders, do you still think that Will Anderson is the better spot for them? Or better uh, for them? I think Carter – if they had the choice of the two top defenders, I'd say Carter would be the, the – okay. he's my favorite pick in this draft. Uh, they could play him at three-tech. You know, they could play he, – he could play anywhere in the front, honestly. So – uh, I think he would be the number one rated guy on the board. Um, our colleague, Daniel Jeremiah, had a mock draft for at least today where Tyree Wilson from Texas Tech actually goes before Will Anderson in this yeah. draft. So I'll be very interested. It's going to be very scheme specific. Uh, if a team is going to run a lot of, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, five man fronts or three man fronts, they're going to like Anderson a little bit more. He's just some more of that typical linebacker where Wilson could play a little bit more as a base end uh, um, mm -hmm. in, in a four man front. So it's going to really depend on scheme, but, but Anderson, um, you know, fantastic player, the bears, if I remember correctly, finished last in sex last yeah, year, um, like 20. Great. Yeah. That's something great. like that. So anybody can get to the quarterback is going to be a great plus for them. If we're getting crazy here, you have the, the Carolina Panthers taking a quarterback at number five. Yeah. Could the Bears move swap five to eight, and would Tyree Wilson actually be a possibility? Potentially. Uh, I think so. Miles Murphy would be another good pick for them out of Clemson, mm. another defensive end if they wanted to go that way. So if they went, uh, that is not – as far as I know, that's never happened, like taking three trades or, you know, even if they do go down to the Colts. They could right? it, it happen though? Back again. Yep, yeah. They could, they could do that too. Uh, that would be another scenario that, that could easily happen. So – I think Anderson, this year he wasn't as productive as he was as a sophomore at Alabama, and mm -hmm. I think teams aren't sure why that would be. Um, he didn't win one-on-one -on -one quite as much. He wasn't quite as dominant, although teams obviously paid a lot of attention to him because of, you know how, how outstanding a player he is. So I'll be very interested at the combine to see his movement skills. There's going to be a lot of comparisons between him and Wilson and Murphy, some of the top yeah. guys, Lucas Van Ness out of Iowa. There's going to be yeah. a lot of discussion about how those edge players are going to go in this draft. See, it seems like it's so deep. And one of the things that scares me about Will Anderson, and I know it's not the same position, but it, it, it reminds me, and I don't know, like this is, if this is out of bounds and you need me to stop talking, just raise your hand and I'll do it. Will Anderson kind of, it's like the, the Derek Stingley thing. And Tyree Wilson is sauce Gardner where it's like, well, one guy was more productive more recently but somebody's had the name and played for the bigger school to where you're like, oh yeah, we'll just go with him. I that's what scares me about Will Anderson. Yeah, I mean, I can, I think he, I can understand that, but I I think Tyree may have been more productive when you look at stats this year. Mm -hmm. But I think honestly, if you really look uh, deep at that film, I think Anderson affected a lot of plays, probably maybe more plays than Wilson without getting a stat. Um, so you have to take that into consideration as well. But Tyree's, uh, he was one or two on my senior list like the whole year. So, you know, I think he's going to be top 10 pick. Uh, yeah. But I think I think you could be, teams don't just look at one year of film when they evaluate yeah. these guys. That's so, true. you know, and, and you also have to, the whole thing with scouting is not, film and stats tell only part of the story because then you have to project this guy into how he fits in your system mm -hmm. and the talent he has around him. So if the Bears, and I, I could easily see this, they say, okay, in our system, what we want to do, the guys we have next to him, what we can do with stunts, twists, et cetera, we can get Anderson free and he can chase after that quarterback. And by the way, he's a pretty good run player too. So, yeah. you know, I, I think he still will end up being picked as the first edge player. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about his a little bit of, um, look, Trevon Walker went number one, and he was much less productive than you know any of these guys. Yeah. So I, I think, and he's a good player. I mean, I like Hutchinson more last year, but I think Walker's going to end up a pretty good player too. So it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't. Maybe I'm, I'm overthinking it per usual. Uh, moving on to, uh, the, to the rest of your drafts. So of course, the, the Bears will be coming around the second round pick is obviously in Pittsburgh. You have, you have the Steelers. I'm sorry, the Baylor defensive tackle i forgot the steelers for uh uh sayaka not, aika sayaka yeah. aika from 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 baylor yeah he's like so that's 350 pounds big boy yeah we're gonna hate him so he's gonna be the guy that we're always gonna be like if chase claypool doesn't pan out we'll look at him and that guy of course the steelers took him like every time it feels like the bears 
Like they didn't take George Pickens. So he yeah. goes to the Steelers and you're like, of course he did. So he's going to go and he's going to be insanely productive and we're going to sit here and look terrible. Uh, yeah, this, but the Bears, this, the, the Bears aren't the only team that did that. A lot yeah. of teams passed on, on George Pickens. Thank they, you. They had a chance. Yep. Thank you. That's what I try to, it's like the whole thing. It's like the Patrick Mahomes thing again. You're like, you yeah. know, there was like eight other teams, including the 49ers who could have used Patrick Mahomes. So don't lump yes. us in. Um, yes. We're not the only ones is I, what I should say. Okay. So uh, the bears, you have the bears moving down again. Is that right? No, I have them moving up back into the first end of the first round to go get the receiver that they want in <sighs> Rasheed Rice from, from SMU. I missed this. Okay. Yeah. So Thank I have them. Sorry, Chad. No, yeah, I'm so, gonna, you know what? Blame Ali. I don't think it's on there. Let me go oh, back did, and look at it. Oh, wait a minute. Really? Yeah. Did he really okay. do that? Oh, I'm gonna, I'll it. check the page because I was like, oh, I didn't see this part of it. So um, I missed the Rashid Rice. Tell us a little bit about okay. okay. So, yeah. So my intention was to have uh, the Bears move up and get Rashid Rice trading up with Kansas City. Kansas City's at a good spot to move out of the first round. Uh, and, you know, having. Oh, so we moved back into the first round. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I just missed this. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Move back from the that pick that they get from Indianapolis at the top of the second round. You you move back up into the first round to get the receiver you want, and that could be Zay Flowers from Boston College if you want a smaller guy. Rasheed Rice is one of the guys from SMU that I like as a bigger body guy, like a six one, two hundred and five pounder um, that can be a little more of an outside threat. You get him and Claypool, Mooney. I mean, they're you need yeah. to build more weapons, right? So I have them putting that. And when you get all this extra, when you get all these extra picks from these trades early in the draft, you're going to yeah. spend some of them to go get guys you want. So this would be one example where they could go get a receiver at the end of the first round, because in the start of the second round, I think is where the run really starts at receiver this year. It's not going to be as uh, kind of like last year, except there's not as many like top line guys in the first round. Yeah. Yeah. No, and he's a good he's a good productive player. I really loved his film. Uh, yeah. Watched a number of games. He was a player that I've actually like of the few wide receivers I've been able to chart so far. And sometimes, you know, I want SEC guys, but I think Rice projects as a pretty good player. And yeah. when you move back up to get him in the first round, you get the fifth year option on him. So when it comes right. to exactly, to and he was targeted over 170 times this year. I mean, that's insane. <laughs> That's insane, but he was SMU's whole offense and, uh, you know, excellent player, uh, a little underrated, I think right now by some, uh, maybe overrated by me, but anyway, I like him. So that's where I'm, no, I'm in. No, I'm in. First of all, um, sorry that I missed it. I must've, yeah, I skimmed no past the end of that. Okay. So I'm sure it's correct. Sorry, Ali, that I was besmirching <laughs> you and your great staff. Uh, they do an excellent job. That's my grant. All everybody. I'm sorry. So I love I love this idea too because I know a lot of people are going to harp on the fact that the Bears gave up essentially a first round pick, but it's not essentially a first round pick because you don't get that fifth year option. So right. that is such a huge thing. And if you get all this draft capital, we get in there regardless of what happens. I love having two first rounders. Now this class is starting to project. We're moving down into this, or we're we're sitting in the second round. We have the Ravens second round pick, which yeah. you know. Ideally, that would have been the one we, we, we traded for Chase Claypool, but what's what's done is done. We're good. You have yeah. us taking Jalen Duncan, a tackle from Maryland. Uh, again, I mentioned this a moment ago, athletic guy, like really yeah. athletic guy. I've heard some things that he kind of projects more as a guard. Would yeah. you see him more as a guard or a tackle in the NFL? Well, I don't really see him as a guard. Um, I, I think he's a tackle. I think you if you... To be honest, I think Braxton Jones, their their current left tackle, projects more of the guard than than Duncan does. But mm -hmm. uh, that's me. But I, I I think I think you could play Duncan and and you could move Jones to the right side if you want, or you could give Duncan a shot at the right side. Really athletic guy. I think he's one of these guys that really has to show at the combine though, because mm -hmm. he had some late of season film that was pretty bad, and he had an ankle issue which made it probably worse. So he's really got to show up. He was fine. You know, and mobile is, is all fine. But um, I think he's going to be in that late second round area in a team. If a team likes athletic tackles, they're going to grab him in that area because you can move him around a bit. Hey, look, if he looks good at guard, good for him. But uh, that's yeah. not where I see him at this point. And, uh, I, you know, like I said, I think Jones would be a heck of a guard, too, because he's a really strong guy for his athleticism. So I really liked him coming out. Well, they really use Jones as – they would pull Jones like you yeah. would pull a guard, but they're pulling him from the tackle position. 
And right. I was thinking, and regardless of the way it ends up, obviously the 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 personnel out there in Chicago is going to determine where they're going to where they're going to yeah. play him. And if, but that shows to me though that one of these guys can actually play left guard, uh, which means Cody right. Whitehair might not be uh, with the Bears much longer. But at some point, you're going to be moving on from these guys. And um, but that does, I look at that as a replacement. The left. The left side would now be young and athletic, and I love yes. that. And if you watch the Super Bowl, if you, Chad, if you watch this, no. But for people out there, who, we talked about this leading up to the Super Bowl. One of the things that the Chiefs and the Eagles both did very well was having these athletic players on the offensive line that can get out and do things. Jason yep. Kelsey being a chief example of a guy that can just get out, make pulls, make blocks. I think that's exactly what the – no surprise, Ian Cunningham, Ryan Poles coming from those organizations. That's the that's way true. the offensive line – is going to look like in the future. All right, so moving on to the third round, uh, you have us taking a defensive tackle who I really like. I, I, I would love this pick in the third round. Brian Young out of Alabama, defensive tackle. One of the things that we hear about him, leadership. And uh, in addition to that, how kind of a what kind of a player does he project to be? Yeah, he's very. Um, I think a lot of Bears fans would really like that explosive three technique to really get that interior pressure, and I think he can become that. In Alabama system, he did less of that because they did a lot of three-man front, and he wasn't asked to do that. But again, a lot of scouting is projecting guys based on their traits, and I think his traits could really allow him to really be an aggressive interior pass rusher if he's charged with that specific task more than he was at Alabama. So that's why I like him in the second or early third round in playing that kind of role for a team that if, if they're going to rely on four-man fronts a lot, if they're going to do three and they want to play him at five technique, I think that's totally fine too. He could handle that situation. So he's got some scheme versatility, and he's got some explosion off the snap, um, high, high motor guy. So I think that would be a really good fit for them. When you see him, does he seem like a Matt Eberflus type of defensive tackle? Uh, I mean, I th like I said, I think he can play a lot of different roles. Um, and, and I think he did actually at Alabama too. He, he lined up a nose tackle at times in, in passing situations. He can get up over the shoulder of the guard, right. And just, and just get in the backfield and, or he can play outside. I mean, he's done a lot of different stuff. So I don't know that there are any schemes that he can't fit. Love it. All right. Well, I love that pick and the final third round pick that you have for us too. I didn't know too much about him, but Luke Whipler, am I saying, if, I, if I'm saying yep. that correctly, yep. He's a center, which of yeah. course the Bears are gonna. I mean, I mean, watch any Bears games. Everybody hated yeah. the center, uh, but and you know, again, is a trend. And I, this is one of the things that I. This is what really stands out. This is what I love yeah. about your diligence and everything you do. He's undersized, but say it with me. He's very athletic. Yes, he right. seems like he seems like the type of player that Ryan Poles would go for. Right, that's right, and uh, I, I think he he does everything pretty well, and and I think when you have that mobility, when you have that ability to lead a line, this kid stepped in really early in his career and took over that offensive line in Ohio State, which was really good, by the way. Yeah. Um, and, and I think when you see him lead a line like that, he's mobile, he's strong against anchor. I mean, he's not, you know, like a 340 pounder strong, but he can anchor pretty well against good uh, size uh, uh, defensive tackles. So he can do a little bit of everything and he's going to, He's a young player too, so he's gonna continue to grow. And I think in the third round, I think that's a you know a really good price to play for for a guy who's got that sort of um, skill set. No, I love that pick. And obviously, with the Ohio State connection, he was a two year starter, so he was not Justin Fields center. Uh, right. Just for anybody who's gonna ask, I will answer that for you. Um, I really no, I I really think that that's a great pick. That is one of the ones that I looked at, like, and you know, it, it's it's. it's a, it's exciting to look at the second and third round guys because a lot of everybody's focused in on what the Bears are going to be doing up front uh, right. with the first couple of picks, whatever they get, wherever they land, one, two, four, eight, whatever it is. These other guys are what's going to be more exciting. Like if Duncan projects to be a, a solid offensive lineman, that's going to be huge. Brian Young could be one of those guys that you look at and be like, how'd they get him in the third round? Right. Uh, Luke Whipple, you know, like these centers, like centers are not usually first round picks. And so if I right. can... Right. sit there and get a young center to develop. I think that's what we want. Uh, if I can look at this, I'm going to, I'm going to look this up. I'm going to say this, make sure that I don't skip anybody. So we have Will, the first three rounds would be Will Anderson, Rashid Rice, first round picks, Jalen yep. Duncan, Brian, Byron Young, excuse yep. me, uh, Luke Whipler. That's, 
that's what five five studs, and then you get the Browns first, the Colts second, and the Colts third in twenty twenty four. Yeah, and you're that's a Packers fan. You're a Packers fan, and you're okay saying all this. You're not. The, I am an objective observer of the entire NFL. Uh, no, you know what? Uh, yeah, I grew up a Packers fan. Yeah, and I, you know, the Bears. But, but in my job, I look at everybody with the same, um, you know, uh, uh, analytic eye. And look, when you are the worst team in the league record-wise, you should have a good draft <laughs> because because you have the top picks. And yeah. especially in a year like this where you if they keep fields, then you have leverage against other teams that don't have the quarterback. So this should be an excellent draft for you. And by the way, when I do my fourth round, uh, four round mock draft here in a few couple of weeks, you're going to get another really good player at the top of the fourth round. I mean, it's it's the guys that fall in the beginning of the fourth round could have easily been, you know, Friday night picks. So uh, sure. it's going to be a good weekend, I think, for you guys. Yeah, you know, it's something that we're really looking forward to. And again, this has been the most, one of the most objective looks uh, at a Bears draft and most realistic. And really, this would be a good one. I know that everybody, again, they, I don't know if we play too much fantasy football and you're like, how do we not get Will Anderson and Skaronsky? And you're like, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works. Um, right. But this is a really good draft, and we appreciate you putting it together. We appreciate you taking the time. Uh, if I may ask already, put you on the spot. When you get the fourth rounder out, can we can we talk again? Do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. Sounds All great. Right. And before I let you go, though, and this might I might blow this up because we have recorded. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the curtain back just so people know. Listen, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to the people. Uh, by the time this comes out, Aaron Rodgers could have already gone into McAfee and retired. But yeah, right. Jordan, let's just real quick. Jordan Love, I'm I'm gonna say talk about objective people. I love Jordan Love yeah. coming out of Utah State. I thought he was a good quarterback. I thought it was a great pick. I thought it was somebody. I thought he he did go in the first round, but I, I thought they, they traded up. They traded up to get him because he was falling a little further than I suspected he would. Hundred percent, yeah, yeah. No, and I and I really liked him. I gave that pick uh, an A minus. I think at the time, I really liked that pick. Um, because you don't, you never see, if you're not a Packers fan, you don't understand what we've already gone through with the Favre Rogers transition. Yeah. Right. And like, you know, Bears fans don't want to hear about quarterback problems. I understand we don't, that, no. but yeah. I'm just saying we've already lived that. So when they have, when you have the opportunity to get a guy who's very talented, who could sit for two or three years even, and then step in and be the guy having not been thrown out to the wolves like Zach Wilson and, and other oh. guys that, you know what I mean? So I, I think that opportunity, even though Packers fans hated it at the time, could really prove um, to be a great move, and we will see in 2023. Yeah, I'm I'm scared to see how well that works out. And he's, I'll tell you this right now, he's a better player than Zach Wilson, more productive, a yeah. little bit better competition. BYU did not play anybody. Uh, yeah. Mount, Mountain West is still a little bit a step above of what BYU walked walked away from. And you know what? I'm going to hit you with one more thing because this is something that I saw online and I, I it's been living rent free in my head. For well, then like, it must be true if you saw it on the well, internet. No, 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 no. This was a this is somebody's observation. We were talking about Walter Play, Walter Payton, and yeah. somebody said that if Walter Payton was a college player right now or whatever coming yeah. through the, he would be a quarterback. Yeah. Do, you agree, do you agree with that? I, I kind of, I'm like, I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I knew I was doing this pod today, and last night I watched Walter Payton highlights, and because nice. he is one of my favorite players of all time, honestly, it's him, Rice, Montana, mm -hmm. um, and you got to put Brady in that conversation. Of course, of course. But anyway, I love, I loved watching. I hated Walter Payton when I was a kid, obviously, yeah. but when you got grew up and you got to know appreciate the talents of that guy. I think he would be my running back. My friend, Matt Waldman does great work in fantasy. He says the, the court, the running back to save the world. I think Walter Payton would be my running back to save the world. And when you watch enough, Walter Payton, you see him make throws. Yeah. And you're like, Oh my God, if this, if, if he was given that opportunity to play quarterback at Jackson state, 
who knows what that guy would have been able to do as a quarterback. So yeah, I wouldn't doubt that for a bit. If he, he could, he could do anything on the field. He could have been a safety, could have been a linebacker. He, he was just one of the best football players period of all time. Yeah, it was, it's an, it, it was an amazing realization. Cause I often joked that the three best bears quarterbacks of my lifetime of my lifetime are McMahon, Jay Cutler, and Walter Payton on the halfback option. Yeah. That, that's the list. Look. And, um, and I'm like, and when, when I, I, I'm, I'm upset at myself and I, I'm really bummed that I can't find the person's tweet who this was so I can give him proper credit. Mm. But like, I'm like, God, that really is true. Cause like Jackson state probably would have played him at quarterback. Yeah. would have let him run around. And then they, people would have harangued him be like, Oh, he's a good, he's a good passer for a running back. But right, like, this exactly. guy would have been, exactly. this guy would have been winning games or even yeah. if like, even as early as the nineties, if he had like, again, at, at Jackson state, cause like UNLV had the wherewithal to put Randall Cunningham at quarterback, right. which I kind of right. feel like there's some similarities there. And, um, so I think it would have been fascinating and it's just interesting yeah, to think absolutely. about. It could have been. Absolutely. I'm, I, I'm a little disappointed. You don't have Bob Avellini in your top three, but that's okay. I think I, not my lifetime, thought... not my lifetime. <laughs> okay. All right. Fine. Fair enough. That's the, that's the thing. I, I got to put it in all bold my lifetime as a bears man. Uh, but in any event, Chad, uh, thank you so much for all the great work that you do for the NFL.com. Thank you so much for taking some time today to talk with us. Go ahead and follow him on Twitter. It's Chad underscore Reuter. Uh, be sure to follow him. And again, I will put this out there to anybody who not necessarily, whether you like the NFL draft or not, I know you play fantasy football, not you, but you and the general audience out there, this is very valuable. This is where you find the guys like Kenneth Walker and Brees Hall. It's, it's following guys like Chad who will give you a little bit of a heads up over your competition in fantasy football as well. So make sure you're following him and uh, do all that stuff. So, Chad, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate the invite. And, uh, you know, Devin Hester might get in the Hall of Fame someday. Oh, one day. One day. Now you had to, you had to bring that up. Get him out of here. Get Chad out of here. Uh, what a great conversation with him. But right now, uh, we, we've got a, a, a young man coming up that I'm sure you're going to love. He'll be coming up right after this. And before we bring on our next guest, I think it's important to remind everybody that the easiest way to play fantasy sports is with Underdog Fantasy. That's right. Go to underdogfantasy.com or better yet, download the app and check this out. If you have not signed up yet, first of all, what, 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 what took you so long? Because it, we had a whole NFL season. What were you guys doing? But if you sign up right now, Underdog Fantasy will match your initial deposit up to $100. Just use the promo code SICK. And if you think that there's not fantasy going on right now, you are insane. The Honda Classic is going to be happening this weekend. Last week, we did the LA Open. I had Max Homa. I had John Rahm. Tagala. I had Rory, who wasn't very good. But still, there's a lot of cool stuff going on to Underdog Fantasy, so make sure you download that app. And it's a cool app to have on your phone. It keeps you up to date with all the latest news and information. And speaking of news and information, I am so excited right now. This, is, uh, this has been a guest I've wanted to have on for quite some time. He was one of my favorite people to work with at the NFL Network. Still, I'm, he's still a great guy. I love having him. Bears fans, not so much. And it bothers me. And I, I go on, and I know he doesn't need me to defend him, but I do. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Let's bring him on right now. You know him from the post. You know him from everywhere. Jason Lockenfora. What's going on, man? What's up, buddy? Greetings from my Nissan Pathfinder. <laughs> How are you? It's been uh, it's been too long. It's been a minute. I think it was uh, one of the drafts I saw you at the last time. Uh, always, And it's always good to see you. I, I will tell. Nice. I always say this because, listen, you know how Bears fans feel. And I always tell this story. This is one of my favorite stories uh, of working with the NFL. Your first week there was the Hall of Fame at Canton, Ohio. You were interviewing the commissioner. And this is the night before you're interviewing the commissioner. And we're having a good time. Had a couple of drinks. You're going up to the room at the behest of your agent. And uh, as you walked away, I, I, I made a remark. And I said, you know, Adam Schefter would buy us shots. And you turned around, lined up some Jameson, bought us shots went up to your room, helped us move a piano at some point later in yes, the evening. Yes, and, there was a piano. You know, and at that point, I was like, this is this is cool. This is why I got into media, is to hang out with people like this. And you also, <laughs> and you're outside of Tom Pelissero. I don't think that there's anybody else in the world I can talk Dillinger for with and would know who I'm talking about. Yeah. 
Um, no, it was, it, we had a lot of fun back in the day. Absolutely. Um, always enjoyed working with you, hanging out with you. Uh, there were a lot of great people, um, at NFL media at the time. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm happy to connect. I, I guess this is risking your bears fandom. Never. I, see, worth speaking it. To worth me it for me. Or <laughs> I don't want to get you excluded from any clubs or, or, you know, secret handshakes that are done behind your back from now on. I, I don't know. Um, so Bears fans hate me that much, huh? Apparently. Listen, every you know how it goes. Like the Viking fans don't like me. Uh, the Lions fans are kind of iffy on me. It happens. I don't know. People just get so I think it's just one of those things that we get so defensive on our about our teams. And yeah. you know, sometimes that happens and you have this misconception about people. And obviously, as somebody who roots like you root for the Orioles. Like I know, and yeah. I know as somebody who roots for the angels, like I take some things a little personally because I feel sure. like sometimes some, some teams get favored more than the other ones. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I hear that. I just like the bears are such a mismanaged, underutilized asset. I mean, just think of yeah. the city they play in the metropolis that they're in the history that's there. And that family just keeps effing it up 10 ways to Sunday. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like th those fans are so browbeaten that like <laughs> they've come to expect the occasional like nine and seven or whatever. Now we're at a, whatever. Nine, nine, I hate this. Nine, nine, 10 and seven, nine. And it like, that's like a, that's like something to be celebrated. It's like, don't let their corporate billionaire socialist cash grab limit your expectations for what, a, what it should still mean to be a Bears fan. Like, I almost feel like the, the people get so browbeat into, like, well, it's been so bad for so long, and so a little bit of this is enough. You Chicago effing bears. Yeah. Monsters of the Midway. And when's the last time they've been good? Three years in a row, even. Like, when, like I'm not even yeah. saying great. They haven't been great in forever. Like, when's the last time they've been consistently good? Don't be mad at me. Be mad at the people yeah. who are stealing your money, who keep raising your ticket prices, and now they're going to get a new stadium. They're going to get another handout. They're going to get another subsidy, and they're going to hide behind that to not spend the way you think they're going to spend. Like, don't bamboozle you. They'll hoodwink you. I'm just trying to ex I just try to expose frauds, and that's a fraudulent franchise. They've been fraudulent for a long time. There's been a, 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 a lot of Bears fans feel that way. You know, my dad would always – bemoan the fact that during the 1980s and this is a little bit before my time but during the 1980s the bears had the greatest team of all time the 1985 chicago bears and that was it that was a one and done as much as we love and believe me bears fans love this love making fun of aaron Rodgers for winning only one ring brett Favre for winning only one ring the bears had the best team in the 80s or you know they were competing against the 49ers and and the washington I don't know even how to refer to them now, but yeah. you know, and they and they had one ring. They lost an they lost an NFC championship game, or was it a, a divisional round game? They would lose games to Washington. They would lose to the 49ers. They had the 49ers coming to Chicago in 1988 and did not capitalize on that. So my dad always had that that kind of uh, sentiment about like that was an opportunity lost. The Lovey Smith era was an opportunity lost, and obviously with Jay Cutler and everything. We know this, and you know I, I think that the hope now with the Chicago Bears, and I'm interested to hear what you have to say about this. The thing with Ryan Poles gives me a little bit of hope is that you know they brought in a guy from a a great, a well-run organization, a family team that kind of knows how to do this. Obviously, the success the Kansas City Chiefs have had. They brought in an assistant GM for the first time as well. It feels to me that at least I don't know, maybe I'm dumb. But it feels like the Bears are starting to set up and become a, a modern NFL franchise. And I'm hopeful that they're going to be able to put it together. What is your read on Ryan Poles? But like, think about that. Think how low. Look, that's just, just, I wish I could hit a replay button on what you just said. You know what I mean? Because it's being viewed as a positive that maybe we're not a complete joke of a franchise. Although we, maybe we still are. But like, there's a chance, like, there's a chance that we're on the road to maybe being respectable mm -hmm. is that and that's that's good enough like that's not well that uh, it's, it's good enough for 2023 problem. but I, I don't i don't want to be talking about this in 2026 you know what i'm saying <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping hopefully yeah. that it's 
panned out. I don't know. Like Nagy to Eberflus, like that seems like that's odd to me. You know what I mean? Like the Chicago Bears keep kind of winging it and trying it. You know what I mean? With guys who don't have any expertise in that particular job. Like that's odd. Like that's odd to me. Like, is that a franchise that's going all out with, with here? We're getting this new stadium. So we're going to go out and try to win a bidding war for a Sean Payton. You know what I mean? Like, like that's not even like, and I'm not saying that it would have been right to bag them after one year. I'm also saying it might not have been wrong if you can get Sean Bleep and Peyton, who has some history. And like, that's not even brought up. Like, I, I never heard anybody like even say like, well, considering all the money they've made for all these years and all the lack of playoff wins and, you know, when's the last time we had a playoff home game? Maybe they could go out and actually compete for somebody who not only was he like polls a part of a winning thing, like he was the main thing in winning a lot of things for a long time, including a Lombardi trophy. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like people have been bashed into like narrow minded, short sighted, non progressive thinking when it comes to expectations for what that franchise could be or should be or should aspire to, you know? And the problem is the division is no longer, am I allowed to cuss on here? And I don't, is no longer horse bleed. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like you're you're now playing catch up to the Detroit Lions. Like that's a fact. That's a fact. That should make people sick. Don't be mad at me for telling the truth. Like what's going on there? And maybe I, Kevin like I'm a big Kevin Warren guy. Maybe, maybe like if you're going to say something to me that I would say, "All right, if that person is empowered to do whatever they want to do within reason, I'll start buying that as a path out of the abyss. I, I, you could maybe sell me on a little bit of that stock, but yeah. I'm not sold on the GM or the coach. Okay, well, that, I, that's just, fine. Just not. It's, it's been one year, and and that's the the great part of not being a fan of that team is you don't have to. And I can sit here and I do this with other franchises where I'm very dismissive of teams that never seem to be trying, never seem to be putting together winning organizations. Look at the Bengals over the last. Uh, they had some success with Marvin Lewis, but they never really fully went in. Those that team practices underneath a freeway, so there's yeah. a lot of NFL owners, and you know it, it typically comes from teams that have been in the hands of a family for a long time, where they're not making an effort. And I'm with you. I listen. It is disappointing and it is frustrating, and you know what? And it does suck that we have to roll back expectations so much to what you're saying. What you're saying is not wrong. And it's what a lot of, this is the funniest thing is like, this is what a lot of bears fans say. And then when they hear it from you, they're like, well, you can't say like the family can say it. But when the outsider comes in, like mm -hmm. I can sit here and talk about my family. But when some outsider comes in, you're like, whoa, 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 sir. We're not going to allow that. I do though. And again, this is me being the optimistic person that I am. This, there are signs that, perhaps they are starting to figure it out. Like the whole thing with building a new stadium leads me to believe like, oh, maybe they've gotten an idea of like, yeah, this is kind of what we have to do to be competitive, to compete in the NFL. I think that when Ryan Pace came in, he had these ideas of like, I want to expand the scouting department. I want to bring in an assistant GM. And they said, no. And then now we watch what happens. Patrick Mahomes does not get drafted. We're an embarrassment once again. I think that they're trying to do things to get it positive and get it into the right direction. Again, I don't want to be having this conversation three years from now being like, I hope this next guy's good. I hope that we're in a situation that, you know what, um, we're going in the right direction. And this feels like a time right now, you know, everybody talks about the Bears being the team that has the most cap space. They got to go out and show it, right? Oh, yeah. And it's not, I've seen... I mean, I've covered a lot of teams at the macro level and the micro level as a beat writer who went out and spent a lot of money. It doesn't mean you spent it like judiciously. It doesn't mean you spent it uh, with any degree of acumen. You know what I mean? It's if you, like it's really easy to win bidding wars ultimately for mediocre players and play them like they're paying them like they're great players. Like that's the one subsidy you get out of the cap, even though it's a soft cap and. You know, the cap didn't seem to mean a whole lot to the guy who owns the Rams uh, last year. It didn't seem to mean a whole lot to Jimmy Haslam, who didn't get anything for it, but at least he spent some money. Like, so, yeah, I, I mean, I guess, but, like, the Chase Claypool trade. Like, I don't know. I don't, like, I, I don't know. You know, like, why did you not tear it apart before the season started? You know? Like, I, I 
I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I can't wait for them to find a better football player on their defense than Roquan Smith. Will. Right. Well, I mean, but again, if they weren't going to sign Roquan Smith to a long-term deal and he didn't fit the coach's scheme, it makes sense to get an asset out of that. It was, it was, it was a situation with him in Chicago where it just didn't look like it was going to work out. And I'm happy that he's going to Baltimore and Baltimore does a lot of things correctly. And so I'm happy. Like I'm, I'm rooting for Roquan Smith. I thought he was a great bear. I just think that the team had made a decision. You know, sometimes certain players don't fit and they move on. And that's exactly, I don't know, maybe that's part of it, of like rebuilding this franchise. The Chase Claypool thing, obviously now, because it is the 33rd pick in the draft, now the 32nd pick in the draft, even though it's not a first rounder, you don't get that fifth year option on it. But yeah, okay, like maybe that was a little bit of an overspend, but at least the team was being aggressive. I think that Chase Claypool is a good player. I think he can develop, develop into something I, that shows me though, that they're going after and doing something like we see other teams like green Bay is skated by, I, I don't want to bring them into it. I, I don't want to make myself feel better by making fun of another franchise, but like green Bay is like a team that never makes moves like that. I was at least appreciative that the bears were trying something. Yeah. I don't know, man. The Steelers, <laughs> that's like trading a pitcher with Tampa Bay. Like, <laughs> it, it, like if you're if you if they're trading you a pitcher, it means and they couldn't figure him out. Chances are it, it might not be who he was drafted to be or what the hype would tell you he is. And you look at them with a receipt with with what they do with receivers, and this guy was surplus the requirements and wasn't going to get paid for a multitude of reasons. Like even with a little bit of homework, there'd be red flags there. And yeah. I, it just sort of incongruous to me. So you're like, I, I don't know. You're selling a 25 year old linebacker. Okay, fine. Who comes to a place where they don't pay people all that much and gets paid in six weeks. Now the Ravens are, they, they have their own issues and, and <laughs> whether it makes sense to pay an off ball linebacker that much or not remains to be seen. He's a hell of a football player. Yeah. And then, you know what I mean? You're trading what amounts to a first round pick, which ends up being higher value than even where they took chase Claypool. You know what I mean? And they look at Chase Claypool's addition by subtraction. Like, I mean, I guess that's what I'm saying is like, it, it's great to have cap room and you know, it, it's, it, that's nice to make moves, but like, it, it's gotta be smart. It's gotta be coherent. It's gotta be cogent. And it's, it's got, you know, I think people are probably there sick of like, it's gotta happen sooner rather than later. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it the, the, some of these returns have to start like, Next year, right? Like there, there yeah, has to 100%. be tangible signs of improvement next year. And so I don't know. A lot of people, look, my opinions are informed by the people I know and trust the most in this league. And there's a lot of skepticism out there that, you know what I mean, about what this regime has done so far. You know what I mean? And the timing of some things and sort of like, well, what were they really trying to accomplish last season? And why didn't you do some of that stuff sooner? Like, I, 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 you know, and, and these are two individuals who are, again, you're not, there, there isn't a body of work there. Like yeah. there's not. And, and at some point in time, I just wonder, like, might you have to go about this a different way, which again, would maybe require you to win a bidding war for a head coach. You know what I mean? Rather than win a bidding war for a left guard. No, I am. And I understand that. And the Bears, until they hired John Fox, had never hired a coach who had had previous head coaching experience. It's one of their things that they've always done that sometimes it works out. Mike Dicka comes in, Lovey Smith comes in, and then you also have Mark Trespin, so or Matt Nagy. Like things yeah. happen that way. I'm I, I wanted Sean Payton. We did this a couple of years ago when he was first uh perceived to be because he was, you know, two years ago when he walked away. You know, I thought that Sean Payton made a lot of sense as well. And that was somebody, but you know what? These, those hires don't always work out though. I mean, we've, we have seen Pete Carroll do it, but we've also seen Jimmy Johnson go to Miami and not do well, or other coaches change spots. Uh, George Seifert went to Carolina. Like there's, there's a lot of times where that doesn't always work. I just think, and I understand. And, and again, the bears are in a position right now where they have not earned the right to to have you not be skeptical because of the the tradition and the history. It's like when, when DC was putting out movies and you're like, I don't think these movies are all going to be garbage. And then every once in a while, here comes a wonder woman and you're like, Oh, boom. You know what? They, they finally figured it out. I think that this is the most telling season for me and how they spend the cap, how they're able to, to maneuver 
with the first round overall draft pick. I mean, that was a gift that landed to them because of Lovey Smith. They've got to go out and prove it. And that's fine. One of the things though, that you mentioned uh, over a couple of weeks ago is that you've heard from people within uh, NFL circles that there's a possibility or it feels like Ryan Poles wants to move on from Justin Fields. Um, what is, what is, what, what is the, what is, what is the word on that? I mean, I, again, I coming out of senior bowl, talked to multiple general managers who were like, I think all things being equal, you know, Justin Fields is going to be a part of a, tr- a pre-draft trade that the bears make to maneuver that board, that that's something that in the right package, he could be elsewhere. Like, and these guys, their hunches, like their feeling is their gut instinct is it's more likely than not that he ends up being moved and that they get their guy and they get, you know, their haul in return. And it's sort of like a blank slate. Mm-hmm. Now we'll is see. It's, 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 it's had multiple dudes just sort of talking about a whole bunch of stuff. And they're like, Hey man, just, you know, keep your eye on this. But like, I think the bears going to end up at the end of the day, I think the bears going to end up moving Justin Fields. Is this a kind of a situation? Somebody else says a similar thing. I'm like, and these are two guys who don't like, they're not like, boo, 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 you know what I mean? Like they're not yeah. like, usually when they, when they sort of volunteer something like that, it tends to be their instincts are pretty damn good. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah, I understand that. Is it a situation though, that perhaps, you know, is Ryan Poles putting that information out there to help drive up the price for that number one overall selection? I mean, conceivably now that the, neither of these GMs would be in the market for just, you know what I mean? Like they're good yeah. at quarterback. So like they have no dog in this fight, you know what I mean? Like, and they're not even in a position to be trying to draft one of these other quarterbacks. So like, maybe we're trying to get this guy pushed there. So there's more guys for us. Like they have, they're not, you know, I mean, maybe they would draft a developmental kid in the fifth or seventh round or something. You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah. something like that, but it, they, there was no ulterior motive. You know what I mean? It wasn't like they called me, like it was in the, you know, in the context of conversations about a whole bunch of stuff and right. both sort of like volunteered it. Like, what are, you, what are you hearing on Justin Fields? I'm like, well, I don't know. I just talked to someone so the other day, and he thinks he's being dealt. He's like, yeah, so do I. I'm like, oh. So we'll see. You know, I mean, it, it. I don't think people should be like shocked if it were to happen. Yeah. You know, like he he they didn't draft him. You know what I mean? He did get you know it. it and I'm I'm a Fields guy. Like I, I want nothing but the best for him. I hope he gets put in a situation where they incubate him like what Howie Roseman's done in Philadelphia, um, whether that ends up in Chicago or elsewhere. Um, so it's not like I have no sentiment in it one way or the other. It's just smart people in this league who I know are very plugged in and talk to a lot of people like they're getting the sense that like, that's going to be something that they think happens before the draft as part of some, you know what I mean? As part of some package for the bears to, move around the draft board, accumulate a lot of assets and go get their guy in this draft. Yeah. I understand the, the, th- the theory of it uh, makes sense when somebody spells it out, but I coming into the last and uh, coming into the draft with Justin Fields, that was the guy that I wanted. I think that, you know, obviously Trevor Lawrence was a slam dunk to go to Jacksonville, but evaluating all those quarterbacks going into the draft, Justin Fields was the guy that I kept talking about repeatedly. That's the guy that I wanted. People thought I was deluded into thinking that Justin Fields even had a chance uh, to get to Chicago. I just hope, I just feel, you know, and this is a a personal thing for me and maybe not completely objective. We've waited so long for a franchise quarterback. You know, in my lifetime, it's been Jim McMahon, Jay Cutler, and Walter Payton on the halfback option. And Chad Reuter, by the way, Chad Reuter says hello. And we were just talking about this a moment ago. Um, But it's, it's been disappointing and and. And I'm not sold on any one of these quarterbacks in the draft right now being so automatic. There's not a Trevor Lawrence out there to be like, well, we have to do this. Even when the when the Cardinals moved uh, Josh Rosen, like you knew, like Kyler Murray projected to be a better quarterback than Josh Rosen. That made a lot of sense. This one doesn't make a lot of sense with me uh, with the Chicago Bears. I hope, you know, I'm not doubting anybody having these feelings or thinking this way. I just hope that that's something that doesn't play out because I am a Justin Fields guy. I still believe uh, the foolishly po- perhaps that this team is going to go about it the right way because we do have a blue blueprint out there uh, of what to do 
with our franchise quarterback. Let me ask you though. Um, you brought up the Baltimore Ravens though. You're kind of you're plugged in in Baltimore. What's going on with Lamar Jackson? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. I mean, I, I, I expect them to be dealt. Um, they're not getting anywhere on a contract. They're not going to get anywhere on a contract. They'll wait until the seventh, right. You know, to, till the deadline of the window expiring to tag a guy and they'll tag them. And, and I suspect that they're a lot of what they're doing at the combine is, um, facilitating this trade because they, they are in essence going to have to sort of act as Lamar's agent. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that Lamar is going to be on the phone with David Tepper and Arthur Blank. You know what I mean? And yeah. Stephen Ross or whoever, Woody Johnson, you know what I mean? Like talking turkey. Like they know what he wants. They they know where it stands. And they're going to have to sort of broker this and, and let people know that, look, this is what he's looking for. Do we think he'd take a little off, you know, to get the hell out of here and go to your place? Because we think he really wants to be in Atlanta. Like maybe, but here's the cost of doing business. And here's what we would want in return. And and I, I think that's where it is because um, the bottom line is they've never paid him one penny over what the CBA stipulated they pay him for five years. You know, yeah. at any point in time, they could have added incentives. They could have added bonuses. They could have added roster bonuses just to let him know that like, yeah, us getting five years of you for $33 million isn't really kosher. You know what I mean? So like there's so many things they could have done to create some sort of a bridge, but, but they never did. And the owner came out almost a year ago and shoved his foot way in his mouth and said a lot of nonsensical bullshit about win me a Super Bowl or else, or I'll just tag you. And you know that, okay, well, the chickens have come home to roost and you just hired a new offensive coordinator and Lamar Jackson. It's not a holdout. It, it, it he would show up week one because he's not getting paid yeah. till week one. And you have never given him one penny more than you had to. So why is he going to go out of his way to help Todd Munkin out or help, you know, John Harbaugh out or, or do you any favors when he's not getting paid for any of that. And you've stiffed him now for two years. You don't want to give him Josh Allen money when Josh Allen got paid. And this guy had already won an MVP and Josh Allen was still kind of fringy. Like, okay, he's the he turn it on last year, but like, is it for real? So, yeah, I think there's, you know, th th I think he, he's, they've worn each other out. And this process is not meant to take this long. And it's dragged on for years and deadline spur action. And can they really install an offense with a player counting $45 million against their cap on an exclusive tag who's going to show up week one? You're going to put him on a commissioner's exempt list because he's going to need two or three weeks to get in shape. And you're going to be yeah. out there with Tyler Huntley or whoever to start the season. Like, I just don't think that's tenable. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, got to think that they're not that naive and so you do what you have to do to move them early in this offseason so you can use that top 10 draft pick from atlanta or carolina or whatever to go get a quarterback or go get an edge and maybe you take the kid from florida at 22 if he's still there but yeah i think that's where it's headed yeah richardson they're starting to talk about him sneaking into the top 10 <laughs> and it might be a situation where they have to move him uh to a team like the falcons or the carolina panthers who are in in indeed in the top 10. It seems weird though. Cause it, like you said, you know, you were talking about how the Ravens come off and they look like a model organization. That team's always in the playoffs. They're always competitive. They give Roquan Smith that turned out to be a pretty good deal for them. They give him a lot of money, but they're missing the boat on perhaps the most important player. Like what gives, like, do they just not think that Lamar Jackson's a good player? The owner doesn't want to pay him. I mean, it's as simple as that. Like, you know, go to spot track, whatever, I think you need a premium subscription to go and look at payroll, actual dollars spent. The mm. five years they've had Lamar Jackson, they were 32nd in payroll and 30. I don't care about the cap. The cap is a boogeyman. The cap is, yeah. it's not a hard cap. It's the softest cap in the world. What was it the cap 220 care. last year? And there's teams at 300. No, 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 no. That's what they want you to obsess about. They don't want you to talk about their team payroll. They want you to talk about how much cap space they do or don't have and which players should do them a solid and leave money on the table to help other players get paid. Get the F out of here. So cash, 32nd. Then they're 18th. Then they're 16th. Then they're 11th, but they've only spent a couple million more than the year before. Like, you look at his cash spend before the pandemic to now, the payroll's gone up like $4 million. And in the interim, gambling money's come in. New Thursday night package came in. New Sunday ticket came in. We've expanded the playoffs. We've expanded the regular season. But Lamar Jackson's the problem. Yeah. Okay. And, he, and he's getting $600 million in free money for a sweetheart deal with a new lease deal to, to, to 
buttress his stadium some more so that when he sells it, he can sell it for five and a half billion instead of five. But yeah. Lamar Jackson's the bad guy. Where's the where's Bashad? Let's see Bashadi's. What how much has he made these five years? He's been in the top half of the league and spending once while this kid was making no money, but they hide behind the salary cap. Well, who the hell's getting paid? You paid Marlon Humphrey and you paid a left tackle. And that's it. Oh, we almost got Zadarius Smith. Oh, Bobby Wagner, we really tried. Oh, we finished second. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Like, get the hell out of here. Like, are you in it to win it or are you not? You had this window. You won one playoff game. You got the kid yeah. concussed in Buffalo because you didn't have an offensive line that year because you didn't want to spend on it. It's frustrating. And it, and it goes back again, talking about the bears, you know, and that's what you want to see. And I think that's the one thing that fans need to be able to do to hold teams accountable is finding out how much they are really spending and really going after it. And, you know, even some teams that you perceive like this is a team that's going for it. Like the Dallas Cowboys last year traded Amari Cooper for no reason. Like, do you want to compete with the Eagles or not? Like, that's the thing that's so frustrating. I did a study a year ago using not Spotrack, but a buddy of mine who works for a team using NFL Management Council numbers. And there was like a six-year period where Jerry Jones's cash spend was like bottom four in the league. It's amazing. And everybody... You know what I mean? Made- and he's hosting yeah. Super Bowls and he's going to get a World Cup match. You know what I mean? He's hosting all these events. He's hosting WrestleManias. Like, what? Yeah. I mean, he, Amari Cooper's not there because he didn't want to pay Amari $20 million. That's it. He wasn't one of my guys. Like, but nobody talks about it. Yeah, no, no one talks about it. Like, nobody, no, nobody talks about it. And it's funny in the NFL, when you do spend, they rip you. Oh, you oh, remember Dan Snyder tried to buy this and tried to buy that? Oh, and I'm yeah. the last person in the world to ever defend Dan Snyder. And I covered a lot of those Frankenstein teams for the Washington Post. But, like, I mean, what are these other dudes doing? But, but yeah. the problem is with the satellite, like you're talking about all the cap space they have. Mm-hmm. Well, go look at that free agent class and you tell me, you, you tell me the well over replacement level players available in free agency, especially when you start factoring what you have to pay to win in free agency, because no. the, it's just, it's it, the classes get worse every year. The cap is going up again. <laughs> so the smart teams are either extending their players or they're like Andy Reid and finding out if the market's going to give this receiver way more than I think he's worth. And I have the best quarterback in football, then I'll trade him and I'll spend those assets elsewhere. You know what I mean? So like, so those guys are either getting paid by their teams or they're getting traded somewhere where they get paid instantaneously with the trade. So then you look at this would have been a great wide receiver market. You know, had Devonte Adams not been traded and had Tyreek Hill not been traded. You know what I mean? And like, you know, like, and there'll be guys who get cut like DeAndre Hopkins or whatever or traded for nothing, but he's one failed PED test away from not playing football. So like, good luck with the cap space. Like it's great in theory, but I mean, there ain't a whole lot of special in their prime players who are no. like percolating all over this market at, at critical positions. The, well, we the, saw it last year. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened last year. That's why Christian Kirk gets $90 million. That's why I'm anticipating a team, probably the Bears, spending way more money than they should on Jacoby Myers and hoping that that works out. And hey. But it, it hopefully it does. You know, it worked out for Jacksonville. Hopefully it can work out for the Bears. But there is a lot of that. Maybe, maybe Minnesota doesn't want to play Justin Jefferson. They didn't want to pay Stephon Diggs. Don't pay Justin Jefferson either and get him out of there. But, yeah, that's yeah. the way it's happening now. That's Like, you can see. Like, it's not difficult to find the teams that want to win football games because they're the ones trading for A.J. Brown. They're the ones trading for, I mean, even Miami. Like, it didn't work out for them this year, but they did make the move to bring in Tyreek Hill. They were showing a willingness to uh, go out there and spend some money. And in season, right, Chubb? I mean, is he the end-all and be-all? No, but, like, like that's... Okay, like you're you're going for it. I, I get it. And that owner, w- and that's not like that's the end. Ross will continue to spend. Now, do they spend in a smart fa- in a smart enough fashion to build it? And obviously, the quarterback, there's issues. You know, there's legitimate concussion issues. Obviously, with Tua. Yeah. Um, but that, like, I, I, okay, like I, I get it. Like I, I see the intent, and there's a body of work with those players. And it's not like if, you know, Chubb turns out to just be 
you know, a slightly above average pass rusher for them, that that means Steven Ross is not, you know what I mean? Is not taking other, any other swings. No, he's, he'll take, yeah. he's going to continue to take some swings. No. And that, and honestly, and that's where I hope the bears are going to be at some point. And again, the chase Claypool thing, we can look at it. I, I understand that the, the, the Tampa Bay analogy makes too much sense because the angels traded for a relief pitcher a couple of years ago who just flamed out the immediately he stepped on the tarmac at uh, orange County airport. Everything went wrong. Uh, so there is a lot of risk, but I am at least appreciative that the bears were trying to do it. And I understand, I understand your skepticism. You, you sound like a lot of my uncles talking about the same things. I just, listen, I'm going to give Ryan Poles this off season and I, I will hold his feet to the fire. If we do not see some progress, because I think the lions, as you said, Chase, like I have no problem. We were talking about this. Was it last night on take it to the rank? Like the lions had outside of the chiefs had the best ending to the season of anybody where they eliminated the Packers, maybe yeah. retired Aaron Rodgers, and everybody thinks they're great. Like, and you won your last game. Not many teams get to say that. So there is there there is a process. But look at the Lions, though. That's the thing. Like the Lions for years, owned owned by the Fords, never oh, yeah. had never had a stretch where they were, you know, a a well run or popular team. And it could fall. They could fall on their face. Absolutely. Season. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm not here to like. I'm not. I'm not crowning the Lions. I'm just saying. Right, I know. They're chasing them. Yeah. That's like fair. they're gonna have to fall. You know what I mean? For you to catch them because there is a talent disparity there right now that I think is fairly significant. Yeah. I, but the, the thing that always warms my heart is that we have the, I, I still believe in Justin Fields. I think we have the quarterback. I think it's an interesting dynamic where the lions have a lot of great assets, uh, but Jared Goff is going to hold them back at some point, but they do have an, uh, they do have an opportunity to draft a quarterback this season. So we'll see what they do. It's a lot of, it's fun. It's a, it's a, it's an entertaining process and everything that's going on. But listen, uh, I know you're going to be on your way to work here. I appreciate. I love that you're repping Baltimore. Um, I always feel like you're the you're the East Coast me, or I'm the West Coast you, because we don't. I think that, that I, I will. I will live like with that. that. That's a good. Comp. I, like, I like that. I like comp. that. Yeah. So I've listen. I've always wanted to have you on. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry that it's been so long since we've been able to get together and talk. I hope we can do this again soon, uh, if you don't mind. Now that I got you in the hopper. All right. Yeah, this maybe. is. This is Rock cool for me, and, and I uh, I love your passion. I love your energy. I love your work, and uh, and it's great to see you. And of course, there you go. I know. Listen, I know a lot of Bear fans are gonna be. I'll never fall. Listen, you're speaking. I I I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just a little bit more optimistic than sure. you. But I but I appreciate well, that's, what, your that's what being a fan is about. Like, yes. so I'm not. I don't want to squash your enthusiasm. But like, if we're, you know what I mean. But like, if we're gonna have this discussion, I'm just I'm gonna just be as honest as I can be. I appreciate it. Listen, you're you're not going to squash my enthusiasm. I appreciate it. I need a little levity every once in a while. I need to be, you know, and it's good. It's good because I think that, as you say, the Bears need to go out there and prove it on the field. We can sit here and talk about theories all we want, but at some point the Bears are going to have to go out and prove it. And so uh, I want to thank you for being here. And uh, we'll do it again really soon. All right, right. buddy. Have a good one. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, Jason. There he goes. The great Jason Lockenfora. Thanks to everybody for uh, putting that together. Sammy and, of course, uh, Anello and everybody with the sick media group. I thought it was cool. Uh, and listen, he's a good guy. I, I think he's fun. I, I, I love his passion. I love his enthusiasm. There's a lot of things that he says that, you know what? Listen, the bears need to go out and prove it. You know, we can sit here and I know that I'm Mr. Positivity and I'm a ray of sunshine, but at some point the bears have to prove it. I have a lot of faith in Ryan Poles. I think he's going to pull it through foolishly perhaps, but in any event, um, that's, that's going to be me, but here's the thing. Big thanks to Chad Reuter for coming in and talking about his three round mock draft. Big thanks to Jason Locken for, and thanks to everybody for tuning into this very special edition of the sick podcast with Adam rank. Who knows when we might drop another one. There's a lot of newsmakers going around. I've got a thick uh, phone book. <laughs> you guys don't know what phone books are. I got a lot of contacts in my phone. How about that? Uh, in any event, thanks to everybody for joining us. Bear down and Sammy, go ahead and play us out. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Adam Rank on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Brought to you by Underdog Fantasy.